Now, it's worth thinking a little more critically about what biocultural evolution might mean and how it might affect the process of evolution itself in humans. What it essentially establishes is a dual transmission mechanism for variation. All of the basic genetic inheritance and genetic transmission and genetic selection and genetic evolutionary forces are still at play. But suddenly now we have a parallel set of evolutionary forces focusing on cultural variation. Now the mechanism for cultural transmission is not still as faithful as that of genetic transmission. Now genetic transmission is incredibly faithful. The genetic variation we possess is transferred almost 100% accurately onto our offspring. Sure, there are mutations, but the rate of mutation is very small. Cultural mechanisms of transmission will be much more variable, so there's a potential for a lot greater and more rapid change associated with it, but also maybe a constraint on the ultimate long-term effects of any individual variant, because it may be unlikely to persist for many generations, given the effects of change that occur from generation to generation. However, when we think again more broadly about biocultural evolution, the potential for dramatic long-term effects is huge. What it establishes is a different mode of genetic change or evolutionary change that's fundamentally different in key ways. One of the ways it's fundamentally different is why genetic evolution is subject to primarily random forces. Natural selection is directional, but the forces that feed natural selection, genetic variation and the creation of it in other words, are random with respect to effects. That's not the case with cultural evolution. Cultural evolution is very much directed. We might have variation in random processes that play into sort of how we do the cultural things we do, but ultimately we're trying to solve problems. We're trying to engage in the world in a very directed, problem-oriented way. So cultural evolution may allow for very directed kinds of evolutionary changes. Now, this might also allow for what we might refer to sometimes as ratchet effects. The ability of one generation to develop problem-solving abilities, basically, that they can transfer on to the next generation, that they can essentially pass on as an inheritance. Think about the way you learn. You didn't start from scratch. You didn't relearn algebra. You didn't relearn geometry from the basics. You had shoulders to stand on. You had previously developed knowledge to use at your disposal, and so that you didn't have to start from square one, although you were learning that process as you went along. The same could be true with cultural transmission of variation. Basically, the ability to develop variation that can be passed on. The inheritance, in other words, of acquired characteristics in the form of behavioral plasticity. Now, this might seem counter to Darwinian ideas of evolution, and in some ways it is, in the sense that it's invoking Lamarckian ideas, or again, the idea of the inheritance of acquired characteristics. But we can see those processes take place in our own life. The ability to transfer on developed knowledge, developed cultural practices, now, of course, this depends on certain kinds of cultural abilities. First and foremost is the ability to speak and convey that information, so language abilities. Now, by the time we get to the Middle Paleolithic, we aren't sure exactly what kind of capacity for language exists. There's nothing in the skeletal record that suggests that Middle Paleolithic humans weren't capable of producing language, but the archaeological record suggests that if they were producing language, it was probably a very uh, prototype or primitive language, not the full developed language that we have today. That's probably something that doesn't emerge until the later Paleolithic. But nevertheless, there probably were communicative abilities that exceeded that which we see in primates, that allowed for greater transmission of information. Now, we also have the development of beginning little bit of hints of increased survivorship in human populations. In other words, more people surviving for a longer period of time. Again, this increases the ability to transfer knowledge from one generation to the next. And potentially, we might see the first grandparents begin to emerge. In other words, the capacity to perhaps transfer information for across two generations, not just from parents to offspring, but parents to grandchildren. And this, again, creates a dramatically different evolutionary environment. The ability to house and store information, cultural knowledge, in an individual not just for 20 years, but perhaps for 40 years, and to transfer that across generations, which allows the transmission and storage of that knowledge perhaps to be hundreds of years long. So theoretically, biocultural evolution fundamentally changes how evolution is working in human populations. It's one of the reasons I find studying human evolution valuable not just for understanding ourselves, but for understanding how evolution operates. The unique adaptations that developed within humans in the last two million years, particularly the large brain and the social niche that humans have come to occupy, change how evolution operates and potentially open the door for evolutionary processes that we don't see in any or if only a few other organisms on the planet. So biocultural evolution is an important lens for thinking about Pleistocene human evolution.